right, so good morning, good evening, everybody. We've got an audience and speakers joining us from like a ridiculous amount of time zones today, and I am so excited to have you back. Some of you I haven't seen in quite a while, so I'm really excited to get the chance to have you back in with us for another Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. My name is Jesse, I'm your virtual adventure guide here, and if you are joining us for the first time, what we do is bring the coolest scientists, explorers, and places into your classrooms through like 40 broadcasts a month uh, with just incredible stories. So a big thank you to you. It's just our second week back in 2023. We've already been to the Philippines. We've been to India already. We were in Antarctica and South Africa just yesterday. It has been an incredible start to a new term, a new semester, and I'm so thankful that you guys continue to join us as we showcase these amazing people and places. Now, today, I'm really excited to welcome back Jai Sharma. He is one of my favorite educators the world. You're all favorite educators. Don't get me wrong. I love you all. It's fantastic to have such great teachers all over the globe. But Jai has done so much work over the last several decades, bringing kids out into nature, giving them those experiences to help them find passion in the natural world, to get excited about it, to want to conserve it. And that is what I'm all about and what Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about. So today, he's going to come in and share stories about biodiversity in India, some of his own adventures as an educator. I'm so excited for you to hear from him, and I can't wait for your questions at the end. So without further ado, joining us in the floor, Josh Sharma, thank you so much for joining us again for our broadcast today. <laughs> thank you, Jesse. Thank, thanks for giving the opportunity. And more than the kids, I think I'm excited to reach out to them, show, uh, show them what we have here. And <clears throat> of course, some of them would be reading and uh, seeing on uh, net or in magazines or books. Yes, I'll show them real photographs and some stories with that. So he, here we go. Uh, this is a very, very short presentation. But yes, um, India is vast. India is one of the most biodiverse country. It's having over, over 1,300 species of birds, 1,500 species of butterflies. 400 species of mammals, 300 species of snakes, 15 species of cats, that is wild cats, the big cats, the small cats, and of course, more than 25,000. Right now, it is about 30,000 plus varieties of plants which are explored till date. And uh, I think scientists are talking that we are still at 10% or 20% of the discovery in especially the microorganisms or the amphibians or the uh, uh, marine life. So these are the two major animals, the national animal, the tiger, and the national bird, peacock. So very briefly, I'm showing you just few of them, highlights of them. And India is divided into basically hotspots. There are five major hotspots. So one is the Trans Himalayan, which is on the upper Himalayas. And uh, it has got most of the uh, coniferous forest, deciduous forest, mix of rainforest, evergreen forest. Then we have this belt, Sundarban, which is a purely macro. Indian coastline is huge. It's close to 30 plus thousand square kilometers. And then this blue dot is the Chilka, which is a wetland, one of the Ramsar sites. That's basically called uh, the, uh, <clears throat> dedicated to the wetlands, whether it's a swamp, whether it's a lake, whether it's a big, big pond. So these are one of the major Ramsar sites, Chilka. Then we have the Western Ghats. This is my favorite area and I live near close to that in Bangalore. And this is one of the most important biodiverse area, I'm hugely uh, populated with elephants, tigers, and I, I've been lucky to spot almost every time. Then we have the desert that is northwest of Gujarat and towards Rajasthan and touching Pakistan. So we have everything from grasslands to rainforest, deserts to deep forest, ravines, and these are some of the places like uh, almost all where I've been standing and uh, highlighted by the species which are found there, like uh, the lion tail macaque. These are highly endangered species, what I'm trying to highlight. Means they are critically endangered or they are uh, near to extinction. And uh, there are a lot of efforts being put by agencies, governments, and geos to bring them back. And we have, as you can see, we have got the Shola forest, that means grasses on the top and then dense forest at the bottom. We have got dense forest of the central India, that is Madhya Pradesh, where it, that's a tiger state, where we have just the deciduous forest going till end of your eyes. And we have the bamboo forest sitting on a machan here, standing near a streamline. So these are the kind of mongoose and otters, they're close relatives. We've got three species of otters. We've got four species of mongoose in India. 
and of course the western ghat forest which is spreading till the uh, horizon so as you can see the time kind of forest we have got large dams large lakes large uh, water reservoirs surrounding or supporting the forest because water streams riparian habitats or aquatic uh, places are the lifelines of any forest and of course yeah, desert do not get uh, so much rain doesn't the desert do not have that much uh, greenery but they are meant to be there like that they are meant to support the system like that so we have got the shrike birds which are also known as the hunting birds or which are known as uh, the butcher birds in uh, south africa we got many varieties we got a beautiful tree pies malkohas indian roller which is a state bird for almost uh, four uh, uh, states and the deciduous or the bamboo forest the sal forest deciduous means they shed off their leaves in summers to conserve their energy go into uh, say hibernation and uh, come back to life when the monsoon comes because they are dependent on monsoon the evergreen forest are pleasing to eyes throughout the year and then we have the sal forest of kana national park tiger reserve always ready so these are some of the big animals the big cats and the elephant uh, which is our state uh, animal in karnataka here and this is one of the largest tuskers i have been seeing this he recently passed away last year and i have been fortunate to uh, see him for almost 20 years and again one of my favorite tigresses tara i have been uh, lucky to walk with her so each story each photo has a story each photo has a connection and this leopard is again i think uh, uh, very rarely people spot leopards and but this leopard i've been able to walk with him and spot him more than five times in last 6 or 7 years is a big uh, dominant male and then the lion which was having a territory of close to from uh, west gujarat to east of uh, india that is still bihar now very remotely uh, it's found in very remote area called gir uh, lion park and the numbers really drastically dropped down from 1 lakh plus to say close to 150 plus and now they're slowly recovering about 750 tiger numbers are also like that there have been various cases as uh, you must be aware like uh, the uh, poaching or trophy hunting habitat loss tusker for their ivory snow leopard for their fur so various reasons the clouded leopards amazing animals amazing the any time i sight them any time i see them they just mesmerize me and they just uh, make me more uh, younger the wolves we have got uh, two varieties of the wolf the gray wolf and the tibetan this was declared extinct which was recently discovered and uh, observed by certain uh, uh, mountaineers in uh, the plateau of tibet then we have got the civet cat the world's costliest coffee belongs to this guy they he processes and uh, manufactures uh, the best of the coffee because it passes through the coffee seeds passes through the gut the sloth bear we got the himalayan bear one of my favorites the wild dogs called the dholes they are the best pack hunters and again i was fortunate to sit in front of them and take picture because they were all belly full otherwise they would have been shy and they would have run away they are not so dangerous but they are yes very intelligent animals we got the jackal the monitor lizards the giant squirrels all of these animals are pretty much in endangered or critically endangered or vulnerable situation they are not very safe right now they are recovering the crocodiles we got the mugger the gharial the snout uh, short snout one and then who will believe that india has the big bovines the buffalo water buffalo the mithun the ghayal which is in northeast india the big one horn rhino which is endemic to just india and uh, parts of burma it is and uh, nepal which is found nowhere else in the world the one horn rhino we got uh, two horn rhinos in africa and the largest cow the indian gaur it's a one ton bulldozer it can kill a tiger and i've seen it fight a tiger and i have been lucky to survive its one of the chases i almost uh, except this buffalo and this mithun i, I think i've uh, had chases from all animals and i enjoy that some of the deer some of the antelopes and um, i'm sure you'll be curious to know the difference between the 
antlers of deers and antlers of antelopes and i'll tell you later in the question or sessions so there's a dancing deer the elk deer which is found in the dancing floating lakes and the floating forest of manipur in the northeast of india to the 12 horn or the barasinga or the swam deer to the spotted deer or the uh, 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 general spotted deer then we have the four horn deer we have the samba deer we got the black buck blue bull the male and the female i put both photos so that there's no confusion the males are generally blue the females are brownish the barking deer this does not have a normal deer call it barks like a dog and the nilgiri thar which is a favorite food for uh, the uh, snow leopard also known as ibex in himalayas and thar in south india out of the 8 or 10 species of monkeys we have got the common hanuman langur which lives in symbiotic relationship with the deer spotted deer the nilgiri langur and we also have the uh, lion tail macaw which you saw the picture now these are some of the birds just i'm i think 0.01% of indian biodiversity i'm able to show in this short time i'll try to be as fast as possible and as uh, much as possible i can show so these are some of the water birds water birds are divided into ducks or the deep water birds and waders which are the shallow water birds so we got a lot of stocks we have got a lot of herons lot of uh, uh, stills and all which are on the shores which are on the shallow waters stills and we have got the kingfishers with the hovering birds these four varieties we got again eight varieties of kingfishers found in india i've been lucky to spot four or five of them uh, one i think i could not take picture and uh, then we have the uh, amazing ducks the raptors the hunting birds i uh, i was finding it very difficult to uh, select the pictures because there are more than say 20 30 raptors i have uh, shot across and uh, taken photographs so some of them some of them which have been uh, 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 up close and i've been able to see them hunt they always are very 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 fast very good i, I think they are a challenge for anybody to photograph because of the speed and because of their agility and always mesmerizing always very very soothing to the eyes so the kind of raptors we have the snake eagle the kites we got oh, more than 50 to 70 varieties of uh, species of raptors and of course who will forget these endangered highly endangered believe me this photograph is two days back i changed the photo the red headed vulture which is very highly critically endangered the vulture population came down because of one single drug called diclofenac and the population from 1 crore plus came down to below 1 lakh slowly they are recovering out of the 12 species we have lost four species which are extinct eight of them are surviving the white trumped the indian red vulture the egyptian vulture and some of them lucky to spot uh, a family of kestrel the male and the female this is on my terrace the shikra my regular uh, guest my regular uh, neighbor and some of these city birds the hunting birds owls of course again we have got more than 28 to 30 varieties of owls these owls are amazing and some of them are shot in the schools cam school campus and nearby that is in the town that is the barn owl the spotted owlet the jungle owlet scops owl also found in one of the schools in bangalore so we were lucky and we have been do uh, documenting that its moment and all some of the deep forest uh, the bigger owls the eagle owl the fish owl uh, these are the uh, larger owls we have the most mesmerizing or the most interesting uh, collection of hornbills all the four uh, five six kinds of hornbills are found in india in south india we got four of them the great hornbill which is a delight to watch when it's flying its uh, wing spans are close to 8 feet the malabar pied the malabar gray and the indian gray so there are a lot of beaters a lot of uh, hunting birds here smaller birds larger birds there are close to say 38 varieties of fly catchers only so i'm just able to put one or two for your uh, information or your uh, upgradation because india is vast it's huge we cannot cover up in one uh, session or maybe one visit honestly i have also not seen more than 10% of indian biodiversity to, uh, to be very honest so the barbets these are something like your woodpeckers and they do burrow the holes they do uh, uh, make holes and look for the grubs or insects or larvae 
and do make homes. So a lot of birds who do not make nests, something like owls, parakeets, barbets, and uh, woodpeckers use these kind of burrows. The pigeons, I'm just putting the most beautiful ones, the yellow-footed uh, green pigeon and the gray-fronted green, green pigeon. Again, we've got over uh, 16, 17 varieties of pigeon found in India. Thrushes, these are one of the most beautiful or the best singing birds. We got the rock thrush, we got the uh, blue thrush, we got the... These are also coming under the passerines, the, the minivets, the jardin sleeve bird, tits, the fly catchers, the bird eaters and all. So they are like singing birds coming under family of passerines. Some of Again, deep jungle woodpeckers. I've been fortunate to spot these kind of these many woodpeckers. There are over 12, for, sorry, 14 species. I've been able to spot about uh, eight to 10 of them. And some of them I've been able to take close photographs. So right from the smallest size, which can sit on your palm to the largest size, which is about the black wood, uh, black white bellied woodpecker, which is close to say one and a half feet uh, big. I've been able to spot them. And some of the nuthatches, the in velvet fronted, the Indian nuthatch, the uh, little ring proverb. This is a kind of uh, shallow water bird or a shore bird, which is found mostly on the riparian habitats or the lakes or the ponds. And the bulbuls, the most, uh, again, amazingly uh, nice voice, soothing voice. The reptiles, the uh, all the four varieties of Poisonous snakes or the venomous snakes are found in India. The crates, the Russell viper, the king uh, saw scale viper. King, vi king cobra is the largest snake in the world or the largest venomous snake in the world, which can grow up to 18 to 20 feet. And it has got the maximum volume of uh, venom. And there are two kinds of uh, venom, which one is uh, the, um, uh, say, uh, which, which affects the uh, brain and one is the, uh, which affects the blood. So the humor toxin and the neurotoxin and king cobra, which is again in the cobra family. We've got the non venomous snakes, the keelbacks, the rat snakes, scorpions. We've got about four varieties. I've got uh, two of you for two of them for you. There are about uh, eight, nine uh, species of say kings, mabuas. I don't know how many are there in the uh, same uh, geckos and all close to, I think 28 and scientists are still discovering. And toads and frogs, these are again vulnerable. They are getting very close to being endangered because of our unplanned developments, unplanned uh, uh, discrimination of nature, damaging or disturbing through noise pollution, water pollution, light pollution. These animals, tiny animals are getting affected. My favorites, the insects, the butterflies, they are providers, they're soil engineer, they're pest controllers, they're pollinators, they're decomposers. They fit in every food chain, they fit in every ecosystem. They are part of everybody's menu in the wild. So from the largest butterfly of the country, the southern birdwing, to the second largest, I've been able to spot that's in the next slide. And they are the most colorful and the most beautiful creatures and the moths, of course, of them. And uh, the the uh, dragonflies this has got the sorry i think the name is wrong here this is the uh, marsh glider or this uh, marsh skimmer ready ready marsh skimmer which is the which is having three world records of longest migration distance from india to south africa that is about 18000 kilometers and back fastest reflex in insect kingdom uh, insect uh, and also the ability to hover all directions like a helicopter top bottom front back anytime because of the independence of its wings so these butterflies are in every sense supporting each uh, ecosystems and life form and the uh, uh, spiders from the largest of the tarantulas to the smallest smallest of the house uh, uh, spiders everything is available here we got the uh, uh, the like the uh, marsh gliders, these are the, uh, are not the, uh, what do you call, uh, sorry, dartlets. And then this is the second largest butterfly, the Malabar tree nymph, which is also found uh, in South India. So most of these are from the Papilinodi family or the swallowtails. You can see the toy tails and all. And some of them are the garden ones. Some of them are found in different 
or almost across the country. The giant wood spider, this is also close to four to five uh, inches long, quite beautiful. They are found in many colors. This is the wild map of India. And as I said, I'm just showing you 0.001% because of the time constraint. And I always will keep fighting with Jesse for more time. And I always leave with this uh, photo, which is um, hitting the mind of everybody. It should hit. Where should we, where do we belong? Are we on the top of the pyramid or should we belong in the center and with giving equal right to all? And if you want to belong on top, will we remain on top if we keep finishing the bottom rows? So points to ponder and I end up my presentation. A small growl of a tiger. Cool. <laughs> What a <laughs> Right, so I yeah, Jai, you can come out of screen share. We can have a bit of a conversation. I know you want to fight for more time, but this way we get so many opportunities to take questions about all those incredible animals that you shared because what a wild uh, sort of biodiversity that is. I mean, as a Canadian, I love the wildlife that we have. I've grown up uh, seeking out wildlife, going to national parks, even close to home. But there's nothing that we have that compares to the sheer diversity, the beauty, the colors of creatures in India. And I'm so glad we got the chance to go on a little tour with you today. So thank you so, so much for that. Um, and if you're good with it, let's dive in with a question. Mr. Richard's class, uh, I, as we said before we got into our lives, <laughs> we're studying some uh, Indian programs together. So if you guys want to unmute your mic, come on and join us. Uh, I will bring you on in. In Amherst View, you are good to go. Hey, Mr. Richards. Hey. <laughs> Uh, first off, thank you very much, Jai. Uh, we were wondering, uh, we we're reading a book about uh, colonialism in India. Were, were there any uh, direct impacts uh, with the natural environment because of colonialism? <laughs> yes, there is a lot of impact on that. And if you are aware, I think India has overtaken China's population. So it is really a crowded country. And we really need to control that in order to save the space for the nature or the environment. Otherwise, the areas are shrinking, the habitats are shrinking, and we are in deep trouble saving them in future. Yeah. And specifically, so one thing that we noticed, uh, and this is just a different aspect of worldview, is when Westerners end up in countries, they tend to hunt things not just for using them, but for sport in a big way. And so in North America, the classic example, this is bison, where people would just shoot them from the train as they were going by, not to eat them, not to use their pelts, but just to kill them for killing's sake. So we find this pretty much everywhere where there's English influence, French, European influence basically around the world. So um, that is sort of the most salient one that I've seen in some of the programs we've done with Indian researchers in the past. And I'm really glad you guys are, are researching this. So. Great job, Mr. Richards. Um, now, we've got a few classes with some tech difficulties today. Mr. Ribeiro's class, we've got Stavely Elementary. I'm Ms. Morris, and I'm sorry you guys are having some issues uh, getting in. Uh, but I am going to go to Ms. Oak's class live, and then any of our classes that are having trouble, just share with me in the chat, and I'll pass along the questions to Jai live in the program, okay? Uh, but Ms. Oaks, Eden Prairie, uh, come Oaks. on in. Eden Prairie, come on in. How does the pollution in India affect plants and animals? Sorry, can I please repeat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does pollution in India affect the plants and animals? Anything that you've seen personally? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Again, uh, the pollution is on the higher side in uh, the urban areas. And uh, where, uh, because uh, it's not evenly spread. There are urban areas which are very claustrophobic or very highly dense and which are attracting or which are creating a lot of pollution, whether it's air or say water or say land pollution and especially plastic which is a menace throughout the world. So uh, the uh, way pollution is affecting is not just the animals or birds. It's in fact coming back to us like the microplastic or the pesticides in the food coming back to us through vegetables and fruits. So of course, equally the animals are also affected. They can't say, they can't speak out, but we are finding in research, we are finding, I've got photographs of uh, 
elephants with uh, in the dung plastic is there so and i've got uh, photographs of tiger again a dead tiger was uh, post mortem and in its belly inside the meat of the uh, deer there were plastic pieces so we can imagine where all it is heading to we um we've done a lot of programs featuring uh, some of the amazing women on National Geographic's Sea to Source Ganges expedition, where they went again the entire river. They talked to communities. They addressed the plastic pollution, how it was impacting wildlife there. So I've just put a link to their sort of findings from that expedition in the chat, both here on Streamyard and on YouTube, and you can check our YouTube channel if you want to see some of the programs with them. But I really love that question, guys. Great job. Uh, Mr. Bajish class, if you guys want to come on in, you're good to go. And then I'm going to head to Staley because you guys got your camera working, which is great. So come on in in Toronto. Hey. We're on YouTube. Uh, you are on YouTube. I know. Jason's here with a question. Um, how many different species like in, Af in India have you seen? Yeah, good question. I've not <laughs> kept the count. I've not kept the count. I think more than, uh, more than five to 10,000. Wow. I'm not kept account honestly. I mean, because it includes you, all the smallest insects to the largest. Yeah, right. Like this is the thing, and it's one of those things that's really hard to wrap your mind around. But there are places in India where, like, one national park will have more species than exist in like all of Canada. It's one of the most biodiverse right. places on this planet. It's it's a really mm -hmm. uniquely special spot for wildlife, and so I'm, I'm I love that answer. That's fantastic. Um, Let's get to Stavia Stavely Elementary. We'll go to Alberta. If you guys want to unmute your mic, hopefully we got the connection working well. Uh, we'll come on up and take a question from you guys. Hey, three fours. Hello. Hi, come on up and unmute your mic. We need to hear from you guys with a question if you've got one for us. I can also come back in a minute. I might do that. I'll be back in just a minute for you guys. And we'll I'd like to also add a um, uh, point to Mr. Richard's question on the colonization. I yeah. think uh, some points I would like to add in case we have time. Oh, we have time. Go for it. Answer. Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, I think uh, on your colonization thing, it started from there. The development of India as well as the destruction of India. Because for development, we had to cut a lot of uh, large spaces of forest. And we can see that in uh, Western Ghats, the live example. And for, say... Uh, the coffee estates or coffee gardens and all, tea gardens, millions of hectares of forest were uh, uh, destroyed. And uh, because of that, we lost huge amount of biodiversity, probably which was not even discovered. Yeah. And that's the cost of development, which I always I feel that we should weigh upon. So that started from colonization. And then because of that trophy hunting and uh, the kings and maharajas, the numbers drastically dropped down, like from of tigers from 1 lakh to, say, 1,000 plus. Lions more than two lakhs to say 100, just 100, 115, yeah. and like vultures from one crore to 90,000. Yeah, it's really uh, quite astonishing that fairly limited hunting for big, charismatic creatures like elephants, like tigers, like lions can decimate the population. You don't need to kill a lot to really impact mm -hmm. their long term survival because they take <laughs> a long time to breed, they're older when they have babies, and so. Uh, we, we've seen this sort of play out around the world. It's sort of there was a there was competition for uh, say masculinity or showing their powers. So yeah. some some king will claim that I've killed uh, ten lions or ten tigers. Other king will say I've killed eighteen. I'm yeah. bigger. I'm stronger. Somebody will say I've killed. So there are records that people have hunted more than hundred plus uh, tigers in a day. Yeah. So that's astonishing and shocking. Yeah. So I, I'm glad that sort of globally we're working to protect creatures like this rather than kill them now. The, the whole mindset has changed around the world, which is a real positive thing that so many people now value animals more alive than dead, value intact ecosystems that are working to protect them. So I'm really glad we got that follow up, Jai. Uh, Mr. Ribeiro, you got all your tech working. Yes. Uh, I'm going to come to you if you want to unmute your mic. Great. If we can take it live, fantastic. And if not, you have typed it in the chat. But welcome in, Grade Sevens. Hey. Ah, your mic still isn't working. Okay, but hello and welcome in. Quick shout out. Um, and they wanted to know, Jai, uh, what are the different noises that tigers make mean? So that roar at the end, what was that? How can you tell the difference? What's going on? Yeah, tigers generally make uh, three to four calls. So one is this uh, roar. This is a mating call. And then there, is, uh, uh, then there is another kind of roar which they use for fighting or, uh, say, terrorizing or scaring the opponent or their rival 
and uh, that's like a growl that's a big not that's not a roll that's a growl and they really oh, like that they do mm-hmm. and then there's a mother uh, which is calling the cubs so when because she needs to move silently and she needs to hide the cubs and all so that's like like this only she it will be very low frequency very low voice so there are three or four kind of they we call it mewing uh, roar and growl yeah it's so nice that you're able to actually like mimic them because you've actually heard all these calls in person mm-hmm. it's such a special experience i love that you talked in the beginning about actually having these interactions with tiger over many many years what a special what a special place in the world um, Jai, we're going to head uh, briefly. Uh, Miss Morrison's class, again, they're having some tech trouble. They're in Brampton, Ontario, which I will note has the best food in all of Canada because they have the best Indian restaurants in all of Canada. It's the biggest oh, thing that I miss living in Newfoundland now. Um, but Miss Morrison's grade sixes want to know what animals are endangered and do you have a favorite animal in India? Uh, see, there are about uh, <clears throat> 800 animals which are endangered in India right now, and there are close to, say, uh, 500 species of plants also which are endangered. Recently, just three plants from Himalayan range uh, region have been declared endangered. It's not that just animals are suffering or even the plants are getting endangered, which is a very serious concern. And if you talk about, uh, say, my favorite animal, it keeps changing the Mm -hmm. kind of area, the kind of location I'm in. If I'm in school uh, garden, my favorite animal becomes spiders and ants. And when I'm in jungle, it becomes leopard or tiger or elephant. Or it could be if I'm in a night uh, trail or uh, night patrolling or night safari, then it is different. Or maybe a snake. So it keeps changing, and I love them all. I uh, love that you mentioned spiders as part of that. But so many people are so afraid of spiders, and they're such a special group of animals. I love spiders personally. I don't necessarily want a big spider on me, but they're really, really unique. I, I hope kids take the opportunity to learn a little bit more about them because they're they're so special. So thank you for that, Jai. Guys, we are going so fast through these questions. Stavely Elementary, I'm going to come to you in a minute. If you want to unmute your mic now, I'll come to you shortly. Um, We've got our folks in Illinois. They are uh, joining online uh, as a family today. Welcome in, uh, Basil Amelia. They wanted to know, are there any animals that have an overpopulation problem? Maybe there's too many of them, and they need to be hunted to help protect other species. In the U.S., pigs is an example. (coughs) In the U.S., is there any example of this that really jumps out? And hey, guys, welcome Uh, in. No, no, uh, not not that way. We don't have any uh, overpopulated animals, but yes, we do have shortages, or we do have uh, certain animals which are in say excess numbers in one area, and they were present or they were found in some other locations. For example, the swamp deer, Barasinga, which was found throughout uh, the central India and uh, northeast India, but then was localized only into Kana and uh, Kaziranga, Manas, and towards uh, Corbett National Park. It was reintroduced in certain areas. So there are certain cases where they're in excess of in one area. So they're yeah. not hunted, but they're relocated to benefit the other areas. Yep. Fantastic answer. Thanks, guys. Great question. Um, Stavely, you're good. Let's see. Hopefully the audio works. I'm coming to Alberta. Hello from Alberta. Hey. Hey. Hello. 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 Do you have a question for us? Um, Merit, your question. Merit is curious about some of the largest animals in India. So we're currently learning about four different countries around the world, and India is one of them. So we're currently learning about landscape and that. Yeah, largest animals. We're curious. Biggest animal, Jai. <laughs> of course, the elephant is the largest uh, mammal to walk on uh, the planet right now, along with the giraffes. Giraffes are not found in India. We have got camels. And then we have got the uh, big four, the uh, the water buffaloes, the bisons, the methun, the gael. And of course, if you take the mammals, then we have got the tiger and the uh, uh, lions. These are the largest animals to roam on the Indian uh, side. You, you have, uh, India is pretty unique in that you have most of the biggest animals in the world and most of the biggest animals in each group too. You have the largest snake in the world lives in India, the largest venomous snake, just on the snake front as a snake fan, plus all the mammals. So I, I'd love to know, by the way, Stavely, email me later, see what the other three countries are and I'll see if I can find you some programs and resources to learn more. Um, speaking of snakes, we've got Yanya in Trenton. Trenton's where my oldest friend grew up. Uh, would love to know how many different types of snakes live in India. Do you know by chance? 
Uh, I have got a book. I've honestly not seen all. So there are close to uh, uh, 118 or 120 species of snakes found in India, and I think I have seen more, not more than 20 or 25 of them. They are a, a very special group of creatures. India is one of the only countries in the world that consistently have snake bite fatality. So they're a rare country where, in some places, you need to be concerned and cognizant of the snakes. Uh, in Canada, in Trenton, uh, that's not something that we need to be concerned about. But do tell, John. I've been bitten by a cobra and survived. That's good. I'm glad. <laughs> was it was it a long recovery or? No, it was. Uh, it was a very uh, young baby. It was just hatched. and unfortunately it came out in somebody's farm house because it was a, it was the uh, hatchling time and uh, their farm house was near the fields and generally cobras lay eggs in the fields and the baby came to the house and i was trying to rescue and since it had very tiny fangs it just uh, could not penetrate beyond my skin skin was numb for 3 months i was in hospital just for 2 days and came back i drove myself to the hospital and drove back myself from the hospital <laughs> You know, when you're driving yourself to the hospital, that's always a good sign. You are our first person ever to be bitten by a cobra in any of our programs. So there you go, students. Um, we're going to head back for another round of questions. See, Jai, when you do a short presentation, we get all these great questions from all the kids. So that's that's it's I'm a bargain that. bargain that we have. Yeah, um, I'm going to head back to Mr. Richards' class. If you guys have a second one for us, come on in and unmute your mic. You are good to go. Hey, <laughs> hi. If the animal numbers decrease, and what is the effect on the environment around them? Great question. Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Thank, thanks for that question. Yes, the animal numbers decrease or the biodiversity decreases. It has a direct impact on humans because we depend on nature more than nature depends on us. Whatever we get does not come from Mars or, or uh, Saturn or Jupiter. We get from this one planet which has got life. So whether it's food, water, or air. So every bit of biodiversity counts, whether it's plant or microorganisms or the largest animals and birds, insects. So if we break one chain or we remove one uh, bit of it, everything gets affected. So it has got a huge impact in the long run. We are already facing food shortages. We are already facing the organic food problems because of the chemicals, pesticides, and GM foods and all. So we are seeing that. Yeah. I've always liked the analogy of you're driving in a car. And if you unscrew one screw in your car, you're probably fine. And if you unscrew two screws, you're probably fine. But if you keep doing that, eventually you're driving along and the car falls apart. And so I've heard it likened where animals in an ecosystem, or plants, or or anything in an ecosystem, represents one of those screws. And so you want to make sure that you're keeping ecosystems intact because you can end up in a situation where a lot of things that go wrong very quickly if you keep removing those pieces that keep the ecosystem together. Now the right. good news is. That there's so many efforts now to rewild, to bring back wild spaces. It is not equal to the amount that we're still taking away ecosystems, but there's been this shift in the last 20 years, really, uh, where people have come to really value uh, intact forests, deserts, grasslands, Arctic tundra, and are, are working to sort of bring back those species, keep uh, a future of abundance. And so it's a great, it's, it's the question actually. So, Mr. Richard, student, thank you so much for that. But that is, uh, I think if you add uh, the statistics to that, uh, in the last 50 years, we lost about 70 percent of biodiversity. We lost about 80 percent of pollinators. So our 90 percent food comes from pollinators. Our 95 percent food comes from soil. We have degraded the soil. The microorganisms in the soil are dying, so it's it's a chain reaction. The soil engineers, the earthworms, the slugs, the ants, the termites, the millipedes—they're all dying. So what do we do? What do we eat later on? Plastic or wood? We yeah. got to decide. Yeah. I, uh, it's the the essence of all we try and share here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So I'm really glad we we dove in with that. Mr. Rivero's class. I know your tech isn't working, but I'll come say hi anyway. I'm going to wave at you guys. Hi, grade sevens. And your second question is fantastic. Are tigers in India moving into cities because of deforestation, and what challenges does this pose if they do? Uh, yes, they are moving towards city more to toward the uh, village sites. There are two reasons for this. One is deforestation. Second is the lack of prey base. So if uh, there are say uh, less number of prey base, because tigers do not hunt deer too much. They need large uh, animals like sambar and the bison or the gors. So if they, their numbers are less, then the tigers are forced to move out. Secondly, they need small corridors of connectivity, which are in the name of development being taken away from them, and uh, they are forced to enter the cities. And this, 
there are uh, very vigilant forest department people working towards say protecting both humans and uh, wildlife so there are a lot of uh, people a lot of scientists a lot of ngos who have done uh, research and made some apps to alert the people if there are some say uh, tiger movements uh, near the periphery or we tranquilize and uh, try to save them or uh, put them back into forest yeah. or if it's really out of control then put them into some remote area or ship them to zoo I um I've never seen footage so far like it hasn't been featured in any documentaries tigers moving into cities but I I've put in the chat for all our classes uh leopards in Mumbai is like a really classic story of big predators living in a big urban area polar bears in Churchill Manitoba actually in Canada is another great one so I really encourage you to check that out Even leopards have come to Bangalore also now there were spotted two leopards uh, nearly I've got a video of that in a school yeah there I mean this is it's such a unique problem to have but it's so important to address the underlying uh, issues <laughs> with it, and, and i think it's so fascinating to have creatures like that right next door uh joy we've got time for a few more questions um so thank you guys we're, we're done taking them in the chat but i'm gonna head to miss oaks in minnesota if you guys have one live for us i'll head to you take a couple from live and then we'll wrap up with stately elementary Stavely come on elementary. in miss oaks hey come on in miss oaks hey Hello, so my question is that if plants can convert carbon dioxide into oxygen, can they do that for other poisonous and harmful gases too? Good question. Great question. Yes, plants have that uh, special capacity that's called as climate amelioration or climate amelioration. And uh, they do this along with the carbon sequestration when they absorb the harmful gases. They do not give back the harmful gases, they retain it and they give you only the right or the uh, useful gas that is oxygen and they retain the carbon that's why they're called carbon sinks carbon is the most important element but the excess is causing the trouble because of uh, which is uh, global warming or climate change is happening so the plants have this tendency plants also have one more tendency in the soil to retain these chemicals and uh, then uh, they convert that so if you notice like if by mistake there are seeds of a plant or seeds of tomato or chili or any uh, vegetable or fruits thrown in sewage. The plant which grows will be healthy. The fruit which comes out is healthy. That's the natural tendency God has given them to filter and recycle and retain the pollutants, give out the good things only. Yeah, that was a really unique question. I, we've never had that in the history of programs. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to head online ever so briefly. Uh, Ryland wants to know in Trenton how big India is. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know the geographical size? It's close to about uh, uh, 3,500 kilometers north to south and about uh, 3,000 kilometers from east to west. And in terms of, uh, say, area, close to uh, some six lakh, uh, some square kilometers and uh, all. And uh, in terms of population, it is about 1.4 uh, billion. Yeah. So uh, for our Canadian friends, we've got a lot of Canadians in the audience today, and that's my frame of reference. Uh, Canada is about three times the size of India, but India is one of the bigger countries in the world. But India has about, geez, I have to do the math here. We have 40 million. You have 1.4 billion. So it's uh, way, way more. <laughs> 20 times, 30 times as many people in one third the area. So uh, a lot of population there, which is fantastic. Um, Stavely Elementary, I'm going to head to you for one final question. I do want to note for all our classes, uh, if you want to learn more about Jai, oh, where did my thing go? If you want to learn more about Jai, I'm going to put his website in the chat in a minute for everybody, and he shared his email at the end. He's, uh, again, one of my favorite educators, because he loves hearing from students after the broadcast. So if you have more India questions, you want to follow up, keep in touch, uh, please do reach out. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Jai, for always being so willing to do that. Uh, but let's head to Stavely, Alberta. If you guys want to do one final question for us before we wrap up, you are good to go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think that Laramie has a really good biodiversity question. If you want to come up even, you can come up here, Laramie. Hey. Um, I was wondering um, what, yeah, what animals are like endangered kind of, and what is the threat? Yeah, what's the threat and some of the endangered species? <laughs> Endangered species, as I said uh, in the previous, I think, question uh, somebody had asked, uh, there are more than seven to 800 species of animals and birds and uh, insects which are in danger of getting extinct. Threats are, of course, first is human population, the overgrowing population. So that creates less habitat or that leaves less habitat for them. 
less resources for them, less food resource, because we are not only depending on the commercially grown crops, commercially grown animals. And if you um, uh, again look at one statistics, that is the homegrown or the commercially grown or the livestock are more outnumbering the wild animals by 10 is to 1 now. That's the scenario globally. So you can imagine the dependency or the uh, pressure on the wildlife. So the threats are, of course, the growing human population, which we need to curtail. And I'm very happy also and very surprised also like the dense population of India with the limited resources, with the limited area, we are still able to retain 25 plus percent of our natural land under forest, which is a big sign. And we are trying to improve that to 30 percent as per the uh, UN uh, global commitment and all, uh, 2030 commitment. And with that, we'll be able to save and uh, probably have more uh, areas under wildlife and uh, improve our biodiversity. Di, that's a beautiful message. I'm so glad that India has been able to protect 25% of their area. And I think our students might know about this, but coming up in February, we have our big art campaign, About 30 by 30, this global effort in India, Canada, all around the globe to protect 30% of the land surface by 2030. We've got several years to do that. There's so much great work being done to facilitate that. So if you want to check out our art contest and visualize a brighter and greener future, we'd love if you participate. Uh, we've been having so much fun with our art contest in the last few months. Jai, this is so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us today as always. And again, if people want to learn more about you, head to your website. If people want your email address, they can reach out to me and I'll put them in touch. Um, but I just really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure and I'm always ready for more. Ready to... <laughs> I, I know you are. No, no more enthusiastic speaker than you. And as you know, what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teachers to say a big thank you and farewell. So, Mr. Richards, Mr. Ribeiro, Ms. Ferreiro, Ms. Avery Elementary, Ms. Avery Elementary, Ms. Ferreiro, Ms. Ferreiro, Ms. Ferreiro, Ms. Ferreiro, Ms. Ferreiro, Ms. Ferreiro, Ms